Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Alyssa, and I'm a developer and a team lead at Red Hat. And today, I would like to talk about reverse engineering of code, or in other words, understanding code and systems that weren't developed by us. And I name my talk, Keep Calm, it's reverse engineering time. Because frankly, uh, whenever I have to do reverse engineering, my initial reaction to that is pretty much this. <laughs> I really don't want to deal with that. Like, really, I want to run away from that. Why? Because, well, reverse engineering, it, it's hard, and it's frustrating, and, and it's time consuming. Anyone else is feeling the same way? Raise your hands. We're in a good company. The truth is, uh, this is really an inevitable part of our lives as developers, and we need to know how to deal with it well. So today, we'd like to talk a, a little bit about uh, some ways and tools that help me do reverse engineering and uh, see how we can survive this task. But before we see uh, how we can survive this task, let's uh, start with why and when would we need it in the first place. So typically, it will have to do something one of those uh, reasons. Uh, we'll be asked to fix a bug or add a new feature or investigate some problem in a customer environment or, or in a SaaS environment. And maybe we have to also do some sort of integration. Now, you might say, uh, I am writing a brand new product uh, and I'm not integrating with anything, so the last bullet is really not relevant for me. But in fact, even if you're bringing Angular into your code, this is also an integration. And passing one incorrect parameter will cause things to stop working, and soon enough, you will find yourself reverse engineering Angular code as well. And dealing with, with code that we are unfamiliar with is really uh, like a whole new world. There's a lot of things we should discover. And as Forrest Gump moms used to say, Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And I think uh, that reverse engineering is really uh, the same as this saying, because there are a lot of things we need to reveal, and there are many unknowns that we have to make knowns. So let's explore a little bit how we can actually succeed there. Sometimes it can be quite easy. We will just ask the person who developed that code and sit together and get all the answers we need. But what happens when that person is unavailable? People have left the company. People move to another department. People simply don't remember the code they developed five years ago. And some people are simply unwilling to help. And I, I've experienced all of those cases. What do we do then? Then maybe we're still in luck. And this is an open source project. And some open source projects, especially the big and the popular ones, have quite a good documentation and wikis. And there is a very good and vibrant community. And we can ask uh, the users and the developers and read the documentation and get our answers there. But what if we couldn't get our answer there or we're dealing with proprietary code? Then I'm reaching this point. We're all alone. The code is staring back at us, and we still have to do the task. Uh, we need to do it all alone and succeed in that. So this is uh, the stage which I call something like back to basics. Um, you need to do step-by-step uh, step all of the steps, and this is definitely the prerequisites to the rest of the reverse engineering of the system. So at first, uh, we need to figure out what technology and programming language is the repo uh, developed in. Because if this is, let's say, Python, and you have never seen Python in your life, stop right there and go and invest like two, three hours in a basic tutorial just to get the feeling of what the thing is. Then figure out what is the source control or the version control of the system. Is it Git? Is it SVN? Is it anything else? Because you will have to do at least check out some branch. You will have to check revision history for files. You will have to create a patch or a new commit. So again, short tutorial. If you're not familiar with that, we'll get you going. Then I recommend to locate the tests. You might have different types of tests, tests for UI, tests for backend, unit tests, integration tests. Locate them and try to understand how can you run them. Because you can understand through tests some places in the code, uh, why do they behave in this way and not in, in another way. And you also will have to use the test and add new tests as you add new changes. And the last step is also very important, the ability to build, run, and deploy. Now, it, did, uh, it can vary greatly from system to system, but you need to be able to take that repo 
and eventually get it to a state where it is a running product, whether there's a compilation step, there is a packaging step, some deployment to SaaS, running locally on your laptop. But you have to be able to go from source repo to a running product to which you can log in, access the UI, the API, and so on. To detect languages example, uh, if we're on GitHub, it's actually quite uh, quick and easy. So uh, who is familiar with the languages bar? Please raise your hand. OK, about a third of the audience. So um, it is not 100% accurate, I have to say. And I specifically put the, this example here. Uh, ManageAQ is not a Ruby project. It's a Ruby on Rails project. And there are some specifics in Ruby on Rails that don't exist in Ruby. But it does uh, get you in the right direction quite quickly. And you understand, for example, this is not a Java project. And you need to focus on understanding Ruby. But not all projects are hosted on GitHub. And we have to know to do it in a different way, too. And we have to do a plain Sherlock and look for hints. The simplest way would be to look through file extensions. Do we have .rb, .java, .py, uh, .js, and anything else? Uh, then we can also uh, look at .gitignore if we have a Git project, because, for example, there might be something like .class there, which can imply we're talking about something that is compiled into a Java bytecode. The readme can also provide us with hints. For example, this is a cloud management platform. It's developed in Ruby on Rails. Here, we got our answer. <laughs> and when we can search, we should search for more hints. And those hints can come from the files that are managing the dependencies, the libraries, and the build part of the project. And uh, this can ser serve several purposes. So for example, we can look at the gem file and gem spec. We can understand this is a Ruby environment or a Ruby gem. Uh, POM XML and build XML can apply again on the Java ecosystem. And it can also teach us what other libraries are used in the project and other components that are used in the project. And in some cases, it can also teach us how to build the project and make it to a running stage. Because again, this is also a prerequisite for us. And now we reach the point where we have to scope our task. Remember how it all started? We were requested to fix a bug, add a new feature, investigate something. And scoping the task can help us to save a lot of time and also get us into the right direction uh, and choose the best strategy how to reverse engineer. And I'll start with a couple of examples just to get a feeling. So minor changes. I listed a couple of examples. There are, of course, more examples for minor changes. Um, fixing a typo in, let's say, tooltip or display name of an enumeration is a minor change. Adding more information to an existing log statement. Persisting a field that is already modeled in our object or a class, but it's still not in a database. So those are all minor changes. But even here, we have to be very careful when we're categorizing our changes uh, as minor or not, because not every typo is a minor change. So fixing a field name in a model can cause us with database mismatch and the serialization will stop working. So that's, that's a typo fix, but it's definitely not a minor change. So just you have to be very, very careful when you categorize uh, the scope of the change. And what works best for me with minor changes is search. OK, I take the string that I have to modify. I run a search through the entire code repo. And probably, most cases, I will find that string quite easily and, quite, and quick. And also, I can search through the existing logs of a running product. And if I'm in luck, I will also find the class name, and in a lot of cases, the method name and the line number where I should do the change. Medium size changes, slightly more complex. Um, I listed two examples. So uh, adding a new field to an existing object or a model could be a medium size change because we need to process it if it's coming from external source. Maybe we need to normalize it, uh, persist it in the database. We need to use it in all the code layers, add it to the UI, add it to the backend, support it in REST API. Upgrading a version of a third-party library is also pretty much a medium change in most of the cases. Still, we have to be careful. Minor version upgrade, definitely not uh, uh, equal to major version upgrade. And even in minor versions, we can get huge regressions. But typically, this is a medium-sized change. And in addition to search, what works best in medium size changes is follow the trail. You know how you're uh, going on a field trip and you have to kind of walk and uh, look at the signs? This is the same. Pick an existing field and check where it's used. You will probably have to do a very uh, similar change. And also follow the tests. 
because the test will teach you how those objects are used. And you will also have to add new changes. The biggest challenge of them all, the big changes. So typically, a big change would be something like refactoring or completely rewriting a model. It still has to behave the same, but you have to rewrite it for some reason. Add a new functionality or a big feature, <coughs> sorry, which requires a deep understanding of the system. And in all of the big changes, you also have to keep in mind on the performance. If you're adding something, and so far the system supported eight, uh, processing of 800 events per second, uh, you need to be aware that your change is not going to drop it to 200. And in big changes, you need to distill the understanding of the architecture of the system, and you need to understand the relevant flows, both the user flows, but also the backend flows of the system, and especially around the areas that you are about to touch. And in all of those changes, from small to big, the number one factor that's working for you and against you is time. Because it's really hard to predict how much time reverse engineering is going to take us. And it is really like we're entering a time tunnel, because we know when we're about to answer that, but we don't know when we're about to exit it. Is it going to be in two hours, two months? We have no idea, because there are a lot of different things we're about to discover that we don't actually know about. That. But we do know what is our goal. And when we're dealing with code, first thing that I typically do is identifying the entry points or the endpoints in the code. What are the most important places in REST API, in backend, in UI? What's the URL to REST API? Uh, what is the more important class in the backend? What is the class that initializes the product, loads the configuration, and so on? You should also learn the class hierarchy. You will definitely not be familiar with all of the classes, but you should know about the most important classes, and if big components have different implementations, you should be aware of that too. For example, if you have an interface for a scheduler, and there are two different implementations for the schedule in the product, and two different components are using two different implementations, it's a very important information. And you should also identify and learn which third-party frameworks are used. If you know that this product is using Angular, but you have no idea what Angular is, it will be really hard to continue effectively reverse engineer the system. Now, you shouldn't become an expert in Angular, but you should have some basic understanding of the concepts and how Angular code looks like. And then we need to get to know the code a little bit more deep. Um, so um, is there a dependency injection mechanism? Do we use Spring? Do we use Juice? How do the components communicate with each other? Is there a message bus, standard method calls? Maybe components are writing into the database and reading it. This is how they sync. And also, very important piece of information are configuration keys that can allow us to get more information from the logs. And I'm not to talking about uh, only increasing the log level, which is also important uh, thing that we need to know how to do. But, I also but I'm talking about something like uh, show SQL for Hibernate that allows us to see queries in the log, and it also teaches us a lot of things about the system. And then there are some things that are not pure code, but they're still very important to the understanding of the architecture and the functionality of the system. Persistency is very important. Are we dealing here with Mongo, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres? It's an important piece of information. How is the data stored? What are the most important tables that we have to use? Where is the code that is doing uh, the connection to the database? What type of code is running there? Are we using plain GDBC? Are we using Hibernate? Uh, where are the data access layer classes? Knowing your container is also important. We need to know, are we using any type of web server? We need to know, are we using any application server? Do we have JBoss? Do we have Glassfish? Uh, do we have Tomcat, Jetty? Thin, um, Passenger, Puma, that's important. Product configuration files are also not pure code, but they tell us a very important story about how the code is used and how the product is configured. 
It could be anything from XML to JSON to YAML to text files. I really, I, I think I've seen them all. Um, but th the important thing here is locate them in, in the product, locate them in the source repo, and understand how they're being used. Are they used directly from the uh, from where they are, from where they are, or maybe they're loaded into the database, and then all of the changes that are done through UI and REST API are reflected only in the database. And you can learn from the content of the configuration file out on the system. For example, you can learn from there how many workers are uh, dealing with scheduled reports. You can also learn what are the default widgets that the user is going to see when the dashboard starts. And some systems are even more complex. We might have several different processes in the system. So it's important to identify which processes are part of the product when it starts. How many processes are there? How do they communicate with each other, too? Uh, are the processes high availability and symmetric? So we can have four different processes that are symmetric. If, if one process falls down, everything is OK. Or maybe every process is unique. So if that process fails, some big part of the system or the entire product becomes dysfunctional. Multithreaded um, is really hard. It's hard to program multithreaded. It's even harder to reverse engineer multithreaded things. And I can only uh, give an advice here that the things that are worth uh, exploring, if we're doing as a general uh, part of reverse engineering, is do we have synchronous or asynchronous code flows? And are we using any standard thread pools, like thread pool executor in Java and, and so on? And all of those explorations we typically do in several iterations. We understand this, we go back here, we understand that, we go back there. And uh, after those several iterations, we're kind of starting to get a picture. And uh, when we're starting to get this picture, I typically do some sort of a sequence diagram. It doesn't have to be full or fully detailed, but it is something like this is calling that, and that is returning this, uh, a UML of the most important classes, or something that looks like UML. And it's important to understand not only the main path of the system, but also the fallback. That component failed, what's going on now? We received too many events, we cannot handle all of them. Are they being rejected? Are they being uh, written to disk and queued? What's going on when not everything is nice and peachy? And if you think about it, iterating over code to understand it is really like solving a puzzle. We have a lot of different pieces. Each piece has its own different color. And we need to know where to place it, but also how to connect it to the other pieces. It's really hard to get through reverse engineering and not actually dig in the code and do it in practice, and I'd rather just read around it. So um, I put here an analogy for mountain climbing, uh, because reading the code and understanding different pieces of code is really like creating those anchors. So in climbing, a piton is a spike that's driven into a crack in the rock, and which acts as an anchor to assist progress in any climbing, because we are climbing, this is a big challenge, we are climbing, and every time we discover something, it is an anchor for us to go higher and understand more. And in code, how, do we, can, how we can create those anchors? So uh, from the trivial one, just read the code. We can avoid that part, right? Um, if we can debug, there's a running system we can connect and debug it, put some breakpoints in some places, read the existing logs of the system, and also understand different parts through unit tests. We can also change the log level if we're on warning, bump it to info if it's not enough, go to debug and so on. Add more login statements, even if it's just temporarily, just for your task as the reverse engineering. Add more login statements. I entered here, I got this, I edited here, I got that. And checking history in, checking history in source control is also very important because it allows us to understand the revision of what happened before us. If, for example, we have to add a new field to an object, then we can check the previous history. Maybe somebody also had to add a new field. And then we can see all of the different files, from translation files to UI to the backend and the uh, database migration script, that we can use that knowledge to do our task. 
My favorite way of keeping uh, all of those anchors, because typically I collect a lot of them for different layers of code, is the ID bookmarks. I use it very extensively in IntelliJ and in RubyMine. And uh, typically it looks something like the class name and the line number, uh, but you can also edit it and put some custom name to that, which is handy when we have five anchors in the same class. I really want to know why I keep uh, each one of them. A lot of people do it in the good old way. Pen and paper works fine. And I would like to spend some time on talking about uh, specifics and tools that works uh, in the backend world uh, or in the server side uh, world of things. So in the Java world, uh, there are utilities that allows you to explore the JVM. So remember, we, as one of the prerequisites, we have to be able to have our product up and running. So JConsole and Visual VM, there are other tools too, but those are my two favorites, uh, are allowing us to connect to a running Java process and get all sorts of insights from there. And um, what we can understand from there is to explore uh, thread names, take a thread dump and see uh, where is the thread originated from, take a heap dump, explore all the classes that are loaded into the system, and check the objects. For example, we know there is a configuration map because we read this in the code, but we would like to see in runtime what is actually part of that map, and we can do that by taking a heap dump. And this is an example of Visual VM. I took a heap dump, and uh, instantly, by looking at the classes, just in a second, I, I can always, uh, also get two hints. Uh, one, we have something to do here with Postgres, and the second one, there is something going on here with Quartz Scheduler. We have some org.quartz um, packages. And you can get a lot of more hints uh, by scrolling that and seeing more classes. Another tool that's very handy sometimes is a network analyzer. It's also called the packet sniffer. And basically, this is software that intercepts and logs traffic or networking. It can decode the data. It can show you the packet, the headers, and so on. Uh, my favorite one is the open source Wireshark. And uh, typically, when I work with it, I like to define filters because I don't really want to read all the traffic that's going on on my laptop. I don't care about that. It takes a lot of time. And I like to narrow it down. So I take uh, the source and the target, the host and the port, and record just that for my specific reverse engineering task. So for example, uh, this is an example how I used uh, the network analyzer for reverse engineering. My goal was to send a SOA envelope to a service. Anyone knows what, what SOA is? Please raise your hand. Two hands, OK. So uh, SOA is something like REST API. It's very similar. It's less popular. Uh, but the difference is that the format that it's using for communication is XML. Uh, my code was in Ruby. I had to create a SOA envelope and to send it to an existing uh, Java SOA service and get a response and uh, work from there. And this was uh, the architecture of the system. So <clears throat> the system had several uh, existing Java report engines and a SOA service written in Java. It was a single process uh, with Tomcat, several web apps inside. And uh, I had to add uh, this last uh, engine. It's a Ruby on Rails engine, and with the help of JVRuby, it could run on a JVM. And uh, my challenge there was, uh, well, this relevant challenge was to also uh, communicate with SOA service and send to it uh, a SOA envelope. Now, I started with um, reading the other reports code and trying to figure out how do they build SOA uh, envelopes. And uh, soon enough, I bumped into a problem they were using some library for which I didn't have the source code. And all the calls were very uh, properties uh, focused. So it was set A, set B, set C. And I couldn't really understand what was the eventual structure on the, of the envelope that was sent over the wire. So I considered uh, taking the jar, because I did have the jar and decompile the code. You can do it, uh, of course. You can de decompile the code and uh, read through that. But I figured out that's probably going to take me too long to understand that code. And again, I don't care about the implementation. All I want is to know how to create a similar SOA envelope in Ruby. I could also code this uh, call to the Java code from Ruby, because JRuby allows me to do that. 
but then I would lose the flexibility of taking this component and run it standalone with the MRI Ruby, the C uh, implementation of Ruby, and I didn't want to lose that ability. So eventually, uh, something uh, I, I thought about network analyzer, and my flow looked like this. Understand at least basically what SOA is. Take network analyzer, create a filter, run the flow in one of the report engines that are written in Java, record and intercept the traffic of the Java code, and uh, figure out where that SOA envelope is in one of the packets, learn how that envelope looks like, and then find some examples uh, how uh, to write some code that creates a SOA envelope in Ruby. Now let's talk a little bit about front-end, because front-end is a completely different world than back-end, and other tools can be used here for reverse engineering. So in front-end, typically, we'd like to discover uh, which libraries are used. Are we doing here Ember, Angular, React, Bootstrap, anything else? Um, how translation files are used? Are they used at all? Uh, where are the icons located? Maybe we have to add a new button or a new icon. We need to figure out where in the system are those files located, which format of the images is used. And also, very important part of it is understanding how UI interacts with the server side. Are we using the REST API? Maybe we're not using the REST API. Maybe there's some misleading uh, thing that the REST API exists, but the UI is actually still not using that because of some historical reason. And uh, the tools that are helping us with, uh, with the task of reverse engineering in uh, front end that I like to use are the Firebug for Firefox and a very similar one, uh, Chrome Developer Tools. They're very similar, um, and they provide us with the same abilities, pretty much. So what can you do with those tools? We can start with uh, following when we uh, start up the UI. Uh, which CSS and JavaScripts are downloaded, that can imply that we're using a specific library. We can see that AngularJS is downloaded, and uh, which uh, CSS are downloaded, are they art CSS, custom CSS, CSS from some, some uh, standard source, and so on. We can add watches in the script tab and uh, kind of check the variables that we care about. We can use a debugger keyword, and it serves like a breakpoint. You can actually debug all that code in, in the developer tools uh, area. And we can also inspect some elements, and it can teach us about part of, parts of the architecture of the UI. And this is an example of uh, inspecting an element. Um, this is just an example, of course. I was curious to see where is the logo coming from for a conference. And um, I just inspected the, the, uh, the logo, and uh, this is what I find out. Uh, the size is 32 by 32 pixels, and uh, this is actually no uh, JPEG and no uh, PNG. This is uh, a dynamic SVG element. Following network requests can also reveal a whole lot of things about both front-end and back-end. And so uh, there is this uh, tab here of network requests. You can see all the requests that are coming in, what was the request, what was the response, uh, were there any errors, and what was the type? Is it, um, is it a JavaScript? Maybe we got a JSON there, and so on. And then we can also uh, see, let me zoom in, we can actually see uh, the exact response that was uh, coming in. So for example, here, this is, um, this is a graph, a D3 graph that visualizes a containerized environment. And uh, this is uh, the JSON that acts uh, as the data for the graph. So we can understand from here that the graph needs uh, items, which are the actual uh, nodes, the relations, so these are the links, and the kinds, which are the entity types, and this is how we build the legend on top of the graph. So the most useful options when it comes to exploring network are those. So the network tab is a general, where we can explore all of the requests. The copy is curl, we can stand on a specific request, and we can uh, right-click and do copy curl, and then we can play with it in the command line. It's much more convenient. We can add parameters, uh, reduce parameters, and learn how that API behaves. We can copy the response, just like I showed, just to get familiar with all, what are the objects that the UI is uh, bringing in and why. And we can also copy the link address and understand, for example, where the images are coming from.
So a word about REST. Um, REST API, uh, typically dealing with that, is very similar to what happens in server-side. So all the tools that I use for server-side apply here as well. Copies curl on the front end can also imply on how we can use uh, the REST API and learn from, from that too. In addition to those, I also like very much to use the REST client. This is an example of an add-on for Firefox that I use quite extensively. What, uh, there's another one for Chrome as well. What you can do here uh, is put a request, uh, put in a request, put in several requests. You can record them as favorites, like anchors in the code. You can add different authentication tokens, headers, and really reuse them um, as you go along with the reverse engineering. And it's also quite helpful. Um, I use this tool for many, many years. So to summarize all this, uh, reverse engineering, is, it, it's hard, and it's time consuming, and it's frustrating. But um, it requires from us a lot of patience. And it also requires for us to be creative. And that's the exciting part, because we can take tools that are uh, originally destined to do something else and use them for our um, purpose for reverse engineering. And there are a lot of different ways to reach the same answer and a lot of different tools that help us to do that. So just remember, whatever works. Thank you very much. And uh, feel free to approach me off stage with questions. <laughs>